Let's take a look at my daily driver phone. I bought this uh, about a year ago, so I've been using it continuously since then. And despite the fact I do have other phones that would be preferable, that like the one I'm using at the moment, I've got the Moto G7 Power, which is a very admirable phone, but I use it mainly just for recording videos. And I could take it with me, but this one has certain features that make it the desirable phone to carry. And as I say, I've been carrying this for a year and I'm very happy with it. It's got one slight bug that annoys me, but other than that, it's absolutely fine. So let's explore it. I'll show, take its cover off. And you can see already, incidentally, it's not a small phone, but there's a reason for that. So the cover, which incidentally, if you have one of these phones, it's a Case Rocks, Case R-O-X-X, -X, fits like a glove, very good cover. So the main thing about this phone is it's a ruggedized phone with a thermal imaging camera. It's also got a laser in it. More about the laser later. So it's ruggedized. It's designed to take significant impacts. It comes with a, a guarantee that I believe covers the screen. If you smash the screen with a certain time, they'll replace it. It's also waterproof down to quite a significant depth. So deep. And it's designed for use under contaminated and salty water because it is an industrial phone. That if you actually use the camera in it, because the screen is normally used to interface the camera, you can select the underwater mode and then it operates off these physical buttons. And that's one of the things that if I'm swapping between phones, I've really, it's quite odd that it's got the physical, you know, buttons that you actually click instead of actually just touching the screen. But they are always there and they're quite easy to feel. Part of the reason for that is that it is an industrial phone that's designed for use with gloves. Um, other features about this that are notable, it's got the uh, the button, the push to talk button on the side. We were playing about with this uh, at the Ember 2 last year because we were having problems with walkie talkies and we did try experimenting with, um, what's, what's the name of that? Zillow. And it worked, it seemed to work okay. There was, I think it, it would take a bit of getting used to and uh, we ended up just going back to the walkie talkies just because um, it wasn't quite perfect. Uh, just mainly because we were working in metal porta cabins uh, where we store uh, some of our stuff and it just didn't, the phone communication wasn't that great there. However, it's waterproof, it's impact resistant and one of its main features is that it's got a FLIR lepton sensor in it. It's got a thermal imaging camera. Let me show you that. So let's uh, turn it on, select the thermal imaging option. It boots into that, it's FLIR's own app. Let's uh, tilt it down like that. And, well, you can see where I've just had my hands in the bench. Uh, but this uh, will detect the thermal pattern. It's a resolution of 80 by 60, which is fairly common for these things. And it's it's FLIR's standard app. Uh, I think if you get the little FLIR ones that slot in the end, it's more or less the same app. Um, it has two sort of ranges. It's got the super high temperature mode and the standard temperature mode. And it's got loads of things like options, like targets that can be dragged in, moved around and uh, it can automatically sense the highest temperature point and the lowest temperature point. This is just the reason I carry it in my pocket all the time, fundamentally. The thermal imaging camera is possibly the winning feature here. That and its ruggedness. Uh, the reason I like rugged uh, phones is because when you're out and about, uh, if you're working outdoors, it's nice to be able to just take this out your pocket in the rain when you're needing data or you want to use the phone, whatever, and not worry about water getting into it. And unlike the the other smartphones you get these days that have the hydrophobic coating on the inside, that still means water can get in amongst the circuitry and it's defeated by certain chemicals and, and solvents and detergents. With this one, it is absolutely sealed. And one of the things, if you get one of these that you're going to have to get used to is these little flaps. Like here's the flap that covers the headphone and microphone port. And there's another little flap in the bottom that covers the charging port. It would have been nice if it had the contactless charging. It doesn't actually have that. But uh, having said that, it's no great deal. Uh, you have to get used to these little flaps. They don't just hinge down. They actually swing out the way like that. You can see a little, uh, the little sort of pivot thing that actually slides out there. And when you get one of these, I'd recommend it feels so flimsy at first, but it's not actually given any problems despite regular charging. Uh, just experiment with them first and get the feel for them because once you do, then it's very straightforward using those little flaps. You just pop them open and pop them closed. And uh, it is waterproof. I occasionally, I mean, I don't go out my way to soak this, but I do uh, occasionally wash it if it gets really manky, if it gets a lot of dirt on it at work. The Sims tray 
is this little bit at the side. It pulls out, it's got a seal around it. It's one of those annoying things that can take a uh, dual SIM or it can take one SIM and an SD card. It's not that much of an issue these days. It was an issue in older phones where you didn't have much memory. Uh, this one is 4 gig RAM and it's got 64 gig uh, main memory. So it's not like, it. it's not really a big issue there. Um, in the past, it would have annoyed me that it couldn't take the two SIMs and the flash, but it's not such an issue. That's why I guess most phones just have it as an auxiliary option these days. The other feature, uh, the laser. Uh, I initially thought, because they had made a big thing about the laser measuring, I have to say, I thought their advertisement was a bit deceptive. I was a wee bit disappointed when I got it because I was expecting... Uh, uh, something like the Leica Distomatic that, you know, you'd basically put this against a wall and further you'd click the button aside, the side and it would give you an accurate measurement within a millimetre. But in reality what it does, uh, it turns the laser on and the app actually looks at the laser dot and homes in on it. It finds the brightest dot in the, the camera image and then it does pixel counting to find it. So once you've calibrated it up, it gives reasonably accurate results based purely on distance from camera to the wall just because the distance of the dot will change, but it's not what I'd call super accurate. However, the laser is also useful for pointing out things because you've always got a laser uh, on hand. The flashlight, incidentally, is also uh, very good, as you'd expect. It's, just, it's a working phone. It's an industrial phone, so it's actually got a decent uh, flashlight in it. Things that are also worthy of note, it has a very odd sensor. See these little holes in the side? It has an air quality sensor. Let me show you that. So there's the air quality app. And uh, it uh, monitors during the day the air quality. At the moment, it says it's 30 parts per billion. It's excellent. What it's actually monitoring is uh, volatile organic compounds. And that's like solvents, like um, like perchloro, perchloroeth. <laughs> Perchloroethylene, is that the right name for it? Uh, but solvents and uh, methylene chloride and um, things like formaldehyde and stuff like that that might be in the air. And if it detects an unusual quantity of them, keep in mind this is an industrial phone, it'll actually sound an alarm. It will trigger an alarm in the unit just to warn you that the atmosphere is contaminated. It, You know, I thought that was a gimmick at first, but I've actually taken a shine to it. I quite think it's quite interesting. It's got a humidity sensor, which almost seems pointless when you're holding it. But having said that, it is sampling the air at the side here. And it's also got a temperature indicator, which at the moment is displaying 28 degrees Celsius because I'm holding it, which it also kind of makes it. I think it's just because the sensor had that function and that's what they used. You know, they just added it as the extra feature. But if you had the, if I'm um, really the temperature sensors and phones, it's not that great an idea, is it? But anyway, moving on. The battery capacity in this is 4.5 amp hour. It's a chunky heavy phone. As a result of that, it, the battery capacity and runtime is fine. I will say that as the firmware has evolved, and the firmware has been a very, very bumpy ride, uh, as the firmware has evolved, the battery life has got better. Um, it just seems maybe that's just been the environment around here because I live in an island, I'm in a town, there's not, the telecommunication infrastructure isn't really, it's not up to 5G standards yet, it's still the old 4G with a beacon in the, the hill and uh, it just means that maybe that's part of the issue, that the battery life didn't seem as long as it should have been early on, but now it's perfectly acceptable, It'll, you know, I, I don't charge it every day, although it gets quite used quite a lot. Uh, the processor in it is a Snapdragon 660, and for those of you who know your processors, it's not like the latest state-of-the-art thing. It's not an iPhone processor, it's not a Samsung S20 processor, but again, for the type of phone, it's not a gaming phone. It can play games, but it's not a dedicated gaming phone. It's absolutely perfect for the function of the phone. Let me see, uh, I've covered most of the features in this. Let me tell you about, oh, the cameras. The camera, aside from the thermal imaging camera, which uh, overlays, I mentioned that the thermal imaging camera is 80 by 60. It actually smooths that out. So the image you get when you look at it looks higher resolution. It doesn't really have to be that high detail for the uh, thermal imaging camera. It's not quite up to the same rather splendid 320 by 240 of my Fleur E4, which is my flacked, my hacked Fleur Flacked, that's a good name for it, Flacked. Uh, hacked E4, which uh, is up to the full resolution as a result of that little 
firmware hack, which is quite nice. Um, that's referenced on Dave's EEV blog forum. I don't know if they've patched that up since. It would be a shame if they had because it made it just an absolutely superb and very affordable thermal imaging camera for for people like us, you know, in the, the sort of hobby recreational side as well as, as potentially less critical, non-calibrated work type things. Because I, th I think that knocks the calibration out if you use the standard hack. Um, so it's 80 by 60, but that is absolutely perfectly fine. It certainly it picks up unusual resolution. Um, it just, uh, I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you about that right now. I like this because at work you can actually scan around and look for hot cables and stuff like that. A, a bad connector that's starting to burn up inside or maybe a piece of equipment that's uh, faulty. You can see if it's been overheating. And while I was up in the gantry uh, at a show while it was running, I was just doing a quick walk along the gantry, checking the cables, and usually I'll just uh, calibrate it off my hand initially just to get a base temperature uh, and just ignore everything below that because otherwise it picks up the, all the audience heads in the distance. And it, it, that way it shows things that are really hot. I noticed when I was looking at the audience that you could pick out just random members of the audience were much, much hotter. It was really obviously were hotter than other people. And uh, it made me wonder if they were under the weather, if they actually were running a fever. And that's, you know, they'd just come to the show because they'd bought their ticket, but they didn't feel too good. And it just made me wonder, um, certainly you can use this. And, and I noticed uh, Naomi Wu uh, recently had a video about that, that the thermal imager, imaging can be used to detect people that are running a fever, so to speak. It won't detect... If they're ill, well, it will detect if they're ill, but um, it won't detect if they're it won't detect if they're ill, but not showing a temperature yet. But it was just that interesting thing I saw that you know you could pick out members of the audience that were just that little bit hotter, and, and obviously so so interesting for uh, scanning a group of people just to see if if that was the situation. Um, I'd kind of got distracted there, didn't I? Uh, the cameras. The camera on the front here is an 8 megapixel camera and you've seen video recorded by it because all the Manx Beard Club live streams recently have been coming from this camera. And it's absolutely fine. The 16 megapixel camera in the back is really good. It has a really good low light level sensitivity, which is great at work. Uh, also, it's got uh, a really good focus. It's one of these things that maybe just because the phone is that much thicker, they've used a much deeper sensor in it. Uh, they've had more space in that area. Um, and it's a very good camera. But it is hobbled slightly by the firmware. That's the one niggle. This is, when I got this, my original intent was it would not just be my daily carry. It would be used for this camera up here recording these videos. That didn't happen because although it comes the camera app itself, it doesn't work perfectly with all other apps and that includes YouTube's own app does not work well with the camera on the uh, back of the phone because there's something going on either in the hardware firmware that causes it to drop frames sections of frames and it's definitely not the processor speed because their own app can record up to 4k and um, I've never actually used that function but uh, it's just uh, it rules that function of using that for recording videos on the go it means that I still have to take my my well what I'm using at the moment which is the Moto G7 power I have to take that with me when I'm traveling with work uh, for recording the videos and this is just kept for a uh, it's my, the one that I carry about uh, other things worthy of mention are there, is there anything that's really, there's no point um, doing like speed tests around that because ultimately it's just going to typically give a, a sort of a Snapdragon 660 performance, uh, waterproof, impact resistant, rugged. It's an industrial phone and it's a very good industrial phone, good enough that I've been carrying it all year. Now, there is another rival to this coming out. A Chinese phone. Uh, I've ordered one. I've actually bought one online to actually try out. Hopefully that will come through. Um, 
the manufacturer of that phone originally contacted me. They said, uh, we'd like to send you one to review. And I thought, oh, that would be quite interesting to do a comparison between the two of them. And they said, oh, that's great. Well, you'll make a positive review and then you'll include this footage that we provide and then you'll send it to us for approval before you release it. And I said, oh, no, I don't do videos like that. I don't do show videos. I said, if you send me the phone, I'll make a review of it. And if it turns, if it, I'll try it out for a while. And if it's good... I'll uh, I'll make a, a positive review giving its positive features. But if it's if it really fails badly, I'll contact you and say this is what was wrong. They said, oh, in that case, no, we're not going to send you a phone. So uh, that just left me a little bit suspicious. If they're not confident in their phone, and one of the things is this is the second generation uh, phone manufactured by Bullet. Bullet actually, it's not Cat who manufactured this. It's it's designed by a British company called Bullet and then manufactured in China and branded CAT. But this is at least the second generation. The CAT S60 also had a thermal imaging camera. This is the next step. It's the CAT S61. And uh, so this is, uh, aside from the fact that there, there's that glitch with the camera, it's it's a kind of a well-evolved phone. It's like they're not new to it. That hump there may actually be part of that because uh, it's got this distinctive hump at the end that I actually really like. It's very distinctive. And I'm guessing that's just to facilitate the, the actual inclusion of the thermal imaging camera, probably to keep it separate as far away as possible from your hand position so that doesn't influence it. So that's something I'm looking forward to checking out uh, when that phone arrives. If maybe because it's a first generation that, you know, it's the one with teething issues. But we'll find out when that arrives. In the meantime, do I recommend the Cat S61? The answer is, yes, I do. Um, It's a very worthwhile industrial phone. It's not something you're going to be playing the latest games on. It's not going to compete in terms of processing power with the iPhone or Galaxy latest models. But if you're looking for one that you can drop and get wet and not worry about it, and that can actually detect electrical problems thermally, then the Cat S61 is actually probably one of the best at this point in time.